<laughs> so, um, but I'm so excited to talk to you. I looked at just like all of your Instagram. I was listening to a little bit of some of your podcasts and I am just so intrigued by the life, honestly, that you've built for yourself. Um, Still building, I reckon, is probably more accurate. It, it's funny because, like, we we moved from Australia over three years ago now, mm-hmm. uh, but I still feel like I'm really fresh legged here, in, where we where we're based now in the Pyrenees in France, and and that's basically because you know the first year and a half of that was sort of like treading water during the pandemic. Um, so yeah, I feel like. Things are starting to settle and take traction now, especially with our business and things like that as well. But yeah, it's been it's been an interesting three and a half year journey to sort of get to this point just now, if that makes sense. Whereas mm-hmm. I feel like where I am now, when we left Australia, my initial feel was that we should be where we are now, probably six months after the fact, not three and a half years. So it's it's been a real interesting time. And I guess things have been born out of that. And, you know, it's probably changed and shaped me as a person as well. Um, you know, dealing with all the unexpected and stuff like that as well. So yeah. Yeah, but I mean I guess that's part of the journey, right? Like there is no there is no finish line. And I guess like if you were going to achieve all your goals tomorrow what would you do after that? You know, it's always, kind oh my of goodness. Like yes. Uphill battle of you think something's going to take like three days, but it takes like a year. So, oh, most certainly <laughs> it, it's funny because like there's certain anecdotes where that just resonates really completely with me. Like, and there's things that have happened that were not even, you know, you don't know what you don't know, but there were things that we're doing that we had never conceived of doing. So for example, the house that we've purchased, it's 300 years old. Um, And I call it a house, but it was never actually lived in as a house. It was always run as a store. So it's like a complete blank canvas. And we're both pretty much DIY renovating the place. So apart from, you know, getting a professional in to do all the wiring and a professional to do all the plumbing, like literally when we moved in here, there was no lights, there was no bathroom, there was no toilet there was nothing so it's like building everything from scratch Mm -hmm. and often when you have a project especially from a do-it-yourself type of project and I think back to stuff that we used to do back in Australia you'd sort of think oh yeah that'll take an hour to do and then two days later it's done (laughs) and I used to have this saying that whatever I thought would take an hour would take at least a day Mm -hmm. whatever I thought would take a weekend would take a month (laughs) so with this DIY house project if I'm thinking, oh, two years, I'm thinking, oh, we're renovating for life, aren't we? So anyway. <laughs> okay, so you had no intentions of renovating a house. I mean, Australia, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys are very a DIY mm-hmm. culture. Like, I feel like every time I hear, maybe not, but like, at least in my circle of understanding, when I think of people in Australia, I always think of like, yeah, we're just doing everything ourselves. But Quite possibly like it's um I guess I've grown up in a household that's done that and and okay. I guess potentially my husband has a little bit as well. I mean his family's from Northern Ireland originally so it doesn't have that long and and my family's like Greek Italian so oh. <laughs> like true like true Aussies were a multicultural mix straight off the bat. Yeah. But yeah, I guess I guess like just even just thinking and reflecting on my own circle of Australian friends. Yeah, well, there, there would be a fair chunk of us that have done DIY projects, not necessarily house projects, but mini projects and stuff yeah. like that. And, you know, like when we lived in Australia, we had a big garden and we did a big de- do-it-yourself sort of outdoor kitchen sort of project. <laughs> we built like a big deck. We we built like a big wood fire oven and, you know, all those sort of things. So, you know, and I guess that that's probably true. I've never thought of it, though. So it's interesting hearing that American's perspective of Australian culture. I mean, the funny thing here is I'm moving into like we are in a tiny French village, like quintessential French village, right? Like the church bells ring every hour from 7 in the morning until 10 at night sort of thing. And, you know, I if I walk out of my front door, I literally have to look left and right because I will step onto the road. Like the house is the right on the road. Um, Our walls are like 90 centimetres thick. Sorry, that's about 30 inches if I've got yeah right we don't (laughs) (laughs) yeah exactly so you know really thick walls I mean it's a 300 year old house 
there aren't buildings in Australia that are 300 years old to, to give you a perspective of, of how ancient or ancien, as we would say in French, that would be. But all our neighbours have embraced us in this small village of like 150 people, but everyone always wishes us bon courage or bon chance, which is like, you know, courage and good luck. I think I think they're thinking, what have these people done? But there's also an appreciation of actually, you know, this young couple that's come to the village, it's actually making something livable again and actually breathing life back into the village. And it, it was quite touching and charming. We've had a few of our neighbours actually when we first moved in just knock on our door and say, hey, we've got this lovely furniture we'd like to donate to you and to, you know, and it's stuff that's, you know, been in this village for literally generations like you know one of our neighbors gave us this beautiful old solid oak sideboard that's their great grandmothers and you know they give it to us with this happiness that now it has a new life you know and it's quite cool but all of this is stuff that never existed in my mind when we left Australia and interestingly we just recently came back from an unexpected trip back home um, just with some health issues in in our family that we had to come back for and coming back to France after having a month with all the mod cons and modern housing and all that sort of stuff and turning the keys and walking back into the ancient renovation project, it was quite funny. Um, but, yeah, every day is a new learning opportunity, that is for sure. Mm-hmm. And did you know French before you decided to move to France? Well, before deciding to move to France, and I guess part of wanting to move to France is we had, so cycling is a major, major passion of mine. And obviously the business is cycling and that's sort of that focus. And so our first trip to France was in 2013 on what we deemed to be the bucket list holiday. Like that was where we would ride and be in these places we'd seen on our TV screens as, you know, fans watching the Tour de France where we were into the cycling and the racing scene a bit, but to be honest with you, it was the scenery that captivated us. And we lived in a part of Australia called the Snowy Mountains, which is all mountainous and stuff as well. So it naturally coming to areas of the Pyrenees where I say there are real mountains, Mm -hmm. it really, like, it was like a strike to the heart. And so because we had had that initial trip in 2013, which we fell in love with and then saved our money and just made it somehow possible and and bought extra purchased annual leave and stuff from our jobs and made it possible to return back a number of times. Learning French needed to be part of that. But I would say we learnt French in those early years of coming here as tourists, as in you learn how do I go to a bakery and, you know, get the cliche baguette croissant, how do I sit at a restaurant or, you know, and order a glass of wine or order food off the menu, how do I go to a hotel receptionist and say, you know, bonjour, j'ai une réservation pour, you know, deux personnes and, you know, or, you know, how to reservations and stuff for, you know, a night of accommodation. So we could speak tourist French, but speaking daily French is very different to that. Yeah. And there's also, so I, I say I'm on a lifelong journey of French language learning mm-hmm. and it is such a complicating language to learn when you haven't grown up speaking it. And obviously I would speak, I, I, I try my hardest and my beautiful neighbours continually tell me that my French is amazing, but I know that they're being nice. And <laughs> It's one of those things with French people, they will correct you if you use the wrong word and they don't do it as a means of like saying, oh, how stupid you are, you use the wrong word. They do it from a place of wanting to help you and they think it's helpful. In Australia, if I was to speak to a French person and they said the wrong word in English but I knew what they meant, I would just let them go with it and I wouldn't let them know because I I would feel it would be rude. But in France, it's not the way at all. And so often I'll say, oh, my gosh, you know, the French language is so complicated for me and stuff. And then they'll respond and say, oh, yes, it is. And it's really complicated for us too. And there's like this funny sense of pride that they have with the difficulty of their own language. So, um, but, yeah, it is, it's a total different experience. And there's things that you don't realise are going to be potentially problematic until that happens. So, for example, you know, I quite regularly, you know, I, I'm I'm quite apt and able in my English speaking world and certainly in Australia and even when we lived in Ireland and I've lived in London before. So I've lived overseas in a few countries. My phone rings, I've got no problem answering it. Someone leaves a voicemail message, I've got no problem listening to it. Fast forward to France, when a French artisan, so like a tradesperson, rings, I'm like, oh my gosh, my phone is ringing. 
<laughs> if they leave me a voicemail, oh my goodness, it is like so comedic. And how many times I need to listen to it before I have an understanding of A, who it was and what they were saying. Because when you speak to someone face to face and they know that you're learning the language, they do slow down the speed that they're talking with. And they probably use basic words and, and they they come to your level a little bit. But when they don't know, it's like, blah, 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 blah. oh, yeah. And mm-hmm. there is no pause button on voicemail. So you can't sort of, and there's no, you know, you know how you could play a podcast or music at fast speed. You yeah. can't do that on a voicemail message. So the amount of times it was quite comedic, the very first time my husband and I, we got a voicemail message, the amount of times both of was like, do you think they said this word? No, hang on. And I must have played this message. Like uh, if I said 30 or 40 times, it's not an exaggeration. And I tried all the tricks. I tried like playing it into like Google Translate, trying to record the message and put it onto my PC to translate into something. And eventually you sort of pick up the odd word, which gives you an idea of, oh, it's actually not for me, it's for someone else. (laughs) So it's quite amusing. But that's a journey that you don't even know you've signed up for. Like you don't even think that that stuff exists Mm -hmm. because in your home country, it doesn't exist for you. You're really confident. You're an adult. You know how to answer the phone. You know how to speak to someone. But, you know, I'll go next door to my lovely neighbor who's like 82 years old and have a cup of tea with her. I'll come back two hours later feeling like I've just sat the most extensive university exam of my life and feel brain dead because I still think, in English so when I hear French I have to translate it in my head what did I hear translate it in English then I have to do another translation of what I understood and how am I responding in the French that I know into French and speak it back and like doing that for a few hours it is intense so I don't know like yeah. have you learned another language before have you been yeah. through this experience oh yeah I, mean, I so I lived in Madrid for a year um I was oh wow awesome English. So I, I experienced that on a daily basis because the kids that I worked with didn't speak good English at all. So I would just stand at the the front of the classroom and like, there's like 50 kids just talking and I'm like trying to understand what they're trying to say. And then it's, you know, they're not very good at English, but I'm not very good at Spanish. And so it's like this back and forth of like, what can what words can we say so we at least like remotely understand each other and I wasn't really allowed to speak Spanish so it was really hard for me to learn Spanish because I was just so like I can hear Spanish and I can understand what people are saying now because I spent a year listening to children speak but if I have to speak back it's really difficult for me so I must say just anecdotally what you've said there A few people have told me that something that will help accelerate my French language learning will actually be watching children's TV shows in French and Mm -hmm. reading children's books. And when I say children's books, I'm not talking about, you know, nine or ten-year-old children. I'm talking like, you know, four or five, (laughs) six-year-old children and doing the baby steps because that's where they're learning their language as well. And so it's, oh, how sadly is it at my level? Like there are times where I have to pull myself up because the – the journey of where I am at the moment and the last three years, it, it it has felt often like I've been cycling uphill all the time, if that makes yeah. sense to use a metaphor. And there's times where I have to pull myself up where I go, wow, I just had a conversation with my neighbour about the water, the stream that's running through our backyard. I would never have even known how to do that a year ago and now I can happily do it. And so sometimes you don't really see the progression you've made when you feel like you're doing a daily struggle but there is Mm -hmm. small steps um Spanish is a Spanish is a fastly spoken language at least to my ear anyway is that the case I so I my one of my best friends was from Argentina and so he would take me to the library every week and he would make me sit down and read children's books like not force me but he was like you need to do this um and I would like translate it to him so he was really helpful because he spoke very slowly with me but I had I lived with a girl from Argentina and I lived with a gal from France and so the gal from France was also fluent in Spanish And then, but she was trying to get better at English and then I'm trying to learn Spanish and then my Argentinian roommate is trying to learn French. So we're just like at this table trying to communicate and they they do speak very fast, but it's my understanding that 
they also think we speak very fast yeah and so yeah oftentimes they're like what did you just say because I would speak English to my American friend and they would just sit there and be like what just happened (laughs) yeah I I think everyone speaks fast when you're speaking in your own language um but it is difficult to decipher like South American Spanish European Spanish Mm. they're very different yeah and see the other thing that we have for us here because we're in the Pyrenees and for those of you listeners that aren't aware that's the southwest of France so mm-hmm. you know right on the border with Spain and the dialect or the well, that they have a different French accent to say Parisian French mm-hmm. and so because we're living here and we're learning from our neighbours, we're obviously learning with that southern dialect. And, it, you know, there's a bit more of a pronunciation of the endings of the words. But then if you're learning, you know, if I'm learning like, you know, on an, on an app, it's teaching me Parisian French. And so then when I hear how people here are saying things, I think they're saying different words to what I've learned sometimes because it's just a little bit different. So it's yeah, anyway, look, it's it's a lifelong journey of language learning. Apparently yeah. it's meant to be good for my grey matter though, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think it is. Um, before we get too far into this, why don't you introduce yourself? Because I never had you do that. Okay, uh, so my name is Bella Malloy. I am, as you can tell from my accent, I am from Australia originally. But uh, in 2020, my husband and I made the big move where we totally shifted away from our office-based corporate careers to pursue a life more with more purpose and more meaning, I guess, by following our passion for for riding bikes and for cycling. And so we moved overseas. Now, our destination is where we are now in the French Pyrenees. But I guess when we left in February 2020, we were on what we deemed to be a stepping stone journey. And that stepping stone initially was to Ireland. My husband's mother and father are originally Irish and from Ireland. So he had citizenship in Ireland, which means he has a European citizenship and European passport. And so we thought it would be a good idea, given we're moving so dramatically overseas, changing careers to maybe have a stepped change. And it was a stepping stone to move to Ireland, to set ourselves up in Europe, get European bank accounts, understand how things work over here. Whilst we would then make our way over to France, look for a house to buy, figure out how we were going to settle and then set up our business, which was travel based. And I say, but because... Obviously, within literally a matter of weeks of arriving in Ireland, and I remember I literally just gotten my appointment for my Irish visa, I think a a couple of days later, lockdowns happened and COVID happened and the world shut down and travel shut down and we had just left our home internationally, signed, signed up for life overseas to start a travel business. And that was all on hold. Initially, we... and. I often think if I had a crystal ball to look back on and and look to the future before we set sights on that plane and left Australian shores, would we have made the move knowing what was going to happen? And it's interesting because I think psychologically I probably would have said no and I would have chosen the safety net of knowing what life would have been like. But three and a half years of going down that path later and going on this journey we are now in our home we are in the Pyrenees things feel like they're gaining traction now and whilst we've probably drawn on our savings more than we had wished to do I feel like the way is forward now so yeah so it's a long-winded way to say my name is Bella I'm Australian (laughs) I live in France and I run a cycling business (laughs) So how did you, because you said that you kind of had this idea of opening this business before you left Australia. So kind of when did that love of cycling begin and what was kind of Oh, your... you're frozen. Oh. Oh, you just froze there. So if you want okay. to re- say that no, question, no, that's fine. You're good. Um, yeah, sometimes Zoom doesn't do the the best. Mm, um, no. What I was saying, when did your... So you said that you had this plan to open this business before you left. And oftentimes, you know, like you leave, you go to another country, maybe you don't have an idea of 
what you want to be doing, but you knew that cycling was what you wanted to do. So how did you kind of get from like, I love cycling, I'm living in Australia, and now we're going to move and open this business. Like, where did that love of cycling begin? And kind of like, where did this idea for a business come in? Yeah, great question. So I, I like many, many people as a child learn how to ride a bike. Mm -hmm. And maybe not like many people just absolutely fell in love with it. For me, it was an escape machine, a freedom machine. (laughs) My mum used to like restrict me to only riding my bike on in Australia, what we call the French nature strip, which was like, you know, the the strip of green grass directly in Mm -hmm. front of your house, which FYI, if you're on a bike is really hard and slow to pedal on. But, you know, when they weren't looking, I would take off on my bike and have these amazing adventures. And whether that was laps of our suburban street or maybe being a little bit naughty as a young child and going a bit further afield, that was always part of my life. But like most Australians, I stopped riding a bike when I was a teenager and then learned how to drive a car and then didn't drive a bike for a while. Uh, I met my husband. He was just into mountain biking. And I thought, oh, wow, I really like mountain biking. Maybe I could, I I mean, I really like cycling. Maybe I could give this a go bought a bike again and rediscovered that passion that I had for cycling as an adult. And I guess if you like riding bikes and you're perhaps slightly interested into cycling as an Australian, you would watch the Tour de France each year and you would see these scenes of amazing French countryside vistas whilst you're watching the sport. And as a cyclist, you have a bit more of an appreciation of exactly the athletic abilities of these athletes as they're going through these amazing scenes. And my husband and I had agreed it would be an amazing holiday to take. Now, Australia is on the other side of the world, literally to France. Mm -hmm. Like diagonally, you draw a line, you are literally the other side of the world, hemispheres and everything. Mm -hmm. And so to get over there was not, uh, uh, you know, it was a significant undertaking in itself to, to be able to get enough time off work to make a long haul flight like that worthwhile and to also ride bikes there. And we did that in 2013 and we followed the Tour de France around. We did not ride the course of the Tour de France, of course, because we're not athletes, but we did base ourselves in different areas of France and rode these amazing famous climbs which would slaughter anything of equivalence in Australia. Like we just did not have that scenery and that type of terrain there. Mm -hmm. And we spent six days of that first trip in the Pyrenees and both of us fell in love with it and I remember we were waiting for our flight at Charles de Gaulle airport to take us back to Australia and we were both like how are we coming back here again we have to come back here again we can't just say this was the bucket list and we've ticketed off because we were just both in love with something new and so we made a pact that we would return And somehow we made it happen. We actually returned the very next year for a shorter amount of time, but that time was spent wholly and solely in the Pyrenees. And for two weeks, we did not do that. We spaced ourselves in one place, did not ride the same climb twice, but just fell in love with it more. Mm -hmm. And we took another two subsequent trips overseas since those two early trips, but started inviting friends along. So in 2016, there was a group of eight of us and we pretty much hosted them in the Pyrenees and took them on rides that we had discovered. And then two years later in 2018, that group of eight, I think, expanded to, I think, 14 or 16 of us. I'm a bit fuzzy in the memory there. But needless to say, quite a large group of friends. And again, for a week, we sort of, my husband and I sort of guided, for lack of a better word, them on these amazing climbs that we had started to grow quite a good bit of knowledge about. And obviously our skill for riding bikes got infinitely better. And it was during the that trip that every single person came back to us and said, hey, you guys are really good at this. Like, you know the area so well, you're really passionate about it. Have you ever considered doing something like this? And we're like, hmm, okay. And I've said this a few times to people before. When you hear nice things said to you about your friends, you realise that that's why they're your friends because friends sort of have to say nice things about you (laughs) like otherwise. And so it's really nice to hear that feedback. But initially you sort of think, oh, yeah, that's really cool. They're they're in the holiday mode and and that's why they're saying that. But Mm -hmm. it did coincide with a time in life where perhaps myself and my husband weren't necessarily that enthralled with our corporate careers. You know, we were both consulting in, you know, amazingly high-paid jobs 
my husband was a finance director. I was a consultant in the HR space for health and safety, employee wellbeing, injury management and the like in the defence industry. And it wasn't the sort of role where I felt I was living my life seven days a week. I, it was the sort of role where I felt I was wishing my life away five days a week so that I could live on the weekends. Mm-hmm. And I guess hearing about something and the thought of maybe we could transition to doing something that we enjoy more, notwithstanding it's hard to do what we're doing now anyway, and there's a lot of hard work involved. It's not it's not just sitting on my bike and going to rides in amazing places. Yeah, But maybe there's an opportunity to actually live seven days a week or, you know, enjoy seven days a week as opposed to, you know, wishing five days of my life away to live for two days. And I guess that's where the thought struck. We spent some time figuring out how would we make this work? What would we do? What would the business look like? And we took a year and a half from coming back from that trip to, I guess, having sold our house, having made business plans, having saved up much more money and taking that flight over and changing our lives dramatically. Yeah. So then when COVID happened, how, what did you do kind of in that period to, I guess, work towards the business? Cause you're not in, you're not in France at this time. You don't Mm -hmm. have jobs, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So that, Period. No, and that was a that was a really hard and complex period of time because I don't know what lockdowns were like for you, but in Ireland it was actually some of the strictest lockdowns in all of Europe. And I spent, I think we were in Ireland all up 18 months. And mm-hmm. I think if I've tallied it up now, 13 and a half, maybe even 14 of those months were in quite restrictive lockdowns. There was lockdown one and lockdown two. Lockdown one, we couldn't leave our home for two kilometres for a number of months. And then that was extended to not leave our home for with the radius of five kilometres for a number of months. All the pubs in Ireland were closed for the majority of our time in Ireland. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, lockdown came in two days before St. Patrick's Day and that was that was over. There were no street parties. There were no celebrations. In fact, even to the degree where for that first lockdown for a number of weeks, restaurants and cafes were actually all closed. They weren't even doing takeaways. So it was like pretty much leave your house for your daily exercise, do your shopping, but actually if you can get your shopping online, get that delivered to you, don't go outside. And so we had just arrived in Ireland with the view that we would actually do some consulting work in Ireland in our old jobs while we to do a house search in France. But that was out of the question with lockdown one. We got to a stage where we maybe considered about should we be on this side of the world with everything happening. But then, as some of your listeners may be aware, Australia closed their borders even to Australian citizens. So Mm -hmm. it was impossible for us to return home. And then even when Australian borders opened up to citizens, there was literally over 40,000 Australian citizens on a wait list to come back into Australia And flights in Australia were so dramatically reduced, you could board a big long-haul flight in Australia that had a maximum of 15 people on board at a time. So it would have taken months for us to get back home, even if we wanted to, notwithstanding the cost of a ticket would have been an absolute astronomic fortune. So that was out of out of the cards and so we found that we were stuck in Ireland not able to get to France because of lockdown restrictions and without a job and needing to start a business which FYI was going to be travel based which was not going to be able to be started but what we did then and our business is an online business it's called Seat Travel Ride we run a website which helps people plan their holidays in France and we are travel advisors so there's a lot of free information on our website that people can look at to plan their own cycling holidays, but when they want to go into more details and plan their actual trips, they can come to us for a bespoke travel advisory service, which for a fee we then provide. And so what we did, being people that have never run an online business before, is we taught ourselves and learnt a new skill. And that's a, that's a skill of website building. It's a skill of travel writing. It's a skill of, you know, Google search engine optimization and all these other things that you don't realise exist. It's a skill of self-marketing. Mm-hmm. And we skilled ourselves in a new job, building a site so 
that when we moved to France and things were able to happen, it was there ready to go and filled with information. And we could sort of, I guess, to say in a weird way, hit the ground running, Mm -hmm. even though travel still wasn't really up and running at that stage as well. So I guess that's a long-winded way of saying that's what we did. We, We kept forward focus. There were times where I guess if I could click my fingers, it would not have been a word of a lie. I would have clicked my fingers to be back in Australia, back with friends, back with family, living a life that wasn't locked down because for the majority of our lockdown in Ireland, Australia wasn't locked down. Um, But I'm really thankful that we have, I guess, stuck it through and kept that forward momentum and that focus on our business maintained so that we put all our efforts into learning these skills, building a website, building a platform that now exists and is our business now. Yeah, well, and I guess if you could snap your fingers, it's always interesting because like you could have snapped your fingers and went back, but then maybe this business just wouldn't have existed. Maybe you would have like changed your mind completely. So it's always, you know, grass is always greener on the other side. It's such a hard thing when you're making those those like passion driven decisions to be like, Oh God, is this the right thing? Because it's not comfortable. And that's, that's the the piece there is like, you're leaving that comfort. And I guess I'm wondering too, like you left your family in Australia. And so, I mean, even now you don't live there. So it's like, do you ever get super homesick and feel like I, I need to go home or like, how do you balance those relationships now that you're in a completely different time zone? Oh, it's, I, f- I find what I miss has been really interesting. So we've literally last week flew back into France and it was our first trip back home to Australia since we left. So it was about three, you know, three and a bit years ago. And that trip came out of the blue. That trip didn't exist a month and a half ago and there was a family emergency that we needed to fly back for. Mm-hmm. And I must say that was the exact scenario I was dreading could happen during COVID times because if there was a family emergency during COVID, we wouldn't have been able to get back into the country. So thankfully that didn't happen then. We got back. Everything is okay with our family, so that's fine. But I thought it was going to be really interesting to see what it was like being back at home. And the biggest thing, it was amazing seeing family and friends. That was like the biggest silver lining. And I don't think I've hugged my friends more in my life, if that makes sense. <laughs> I don't think they've hugged me more in my life. And there's moments where I feel, and it was really clear that I could so easily turn the keys in my French home, go back to Australia and slip on that coat of my old life. I could go back into an, a very similar role in my old position We still have our apartment in Australia. I could, you know, when the lease is over on our tenant, could move right back in, slot straight back into my friendships, back into my social routines and have that old life. And the same for my husband as well. And what was even clearer was nothing had really changed about that life back at home. There's new buildings and places and developments Our friends are exactly the same, which is great. And those friendship bonds maybe have possibly grown a bit stronger due to separation. And our family's getting a bit older, but day-to-day life is exactly the same. And it really struck me and I was quite confused about it because it felt like no one had changed, but I had changed. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's because of what I've potentially endured that was vastly different to what it was like back at home as well. Um, and we were sat at the table at a dinner with friends having a catch-up that, you know, all of us as a group hadn't had for over three years. And it was actually one of my friends said to me, have you found that you've come back and nothing's changed? And I said, yes. And he goes, that's a sign that you've done the right thing. And I go, really? And he goes, and I sort of had this light bulb aha moment when they were explaining that, your life here can always be here for you. Your friends are always here for you. But this dream that you need to follow won't always be here for you if you if you shut the door now. And you know you've done the right thing if nothing's changed, but you're having experiences which are different. So keep doing that and be be adventurous and be bold and keep following it. And there's times now when I reflect back on that and think that's a conversation I really needed to hear. And it was funny coming back on the flight 
I can never sleep on flights and the flight, you really realise how far Australia is when you do a long haul flight. It's horrendous. Like the first flight that leaves from Sydney to get back to the, you know, Europe is a short flight. It's only like eight hours or so. But the next flight, the pilot gets on as you're taxiing to the runway in Singapore and says, you know, we've got a long taxi to the runway uh, in about 20 minutes, but uh, strap in, good flying conditions, and our total flight time is 13 hours and 40 minutes. <laughs> you're like, oh, my gosh, please. <laughs> like, it's a long, long flight. And I can't sleep on that flight. And funnily enough, I wasn't into the entertainment system. I didn't want to watch a movie. I didn't want to read a book. I listened to a bit of music. French music because I'm trying to learn French Mm -hmm. and I just constantly had these thoughts about potential parallel you you know butterfly effects sliding doors Mm -hmm. I could slide back to that life do I want the struggle of day-to-day of what we're doing here in France because we are really establishing our business it's up and running now because travel's sort of back but it's still in its infancy you know I can't go and just pick the phone up without doing a lot of thinking in my head about what I want to say on the phone and stuff like that. I could slip back into my old life with ease. Do I want this struggle? And I remember then getting back and actually having a text with one of my best friends in Australia sort of saying, you know, sometimes I wonder, is this the right decision? Have I made the right decision? And they, again, with their wisdom, and they've, they're a friend but also a mentor to me, also said, your friends are here, your life's here, your skill set's still there. It's still going to be there in 12 years, in five years, in 10 years. Mm-hmm. Keep keep doing what you're doing because you can always come back to this. And I guess that's been the resounding advice and information that I've needed to hear to keep me on this path. It's mm-hmm. been super, super interesting. And I guess in terms of maintaining relationships, I don't necessarily miss Australia. I miss people. And when I say I don't miss Australia, I love Australian landscape, you know. I love the beaches. I love the outdoor space and stuff like that. But I absolutely love France and I love French culture and I love the French mountains and I love the French way of life here in the Pyrenees as well. If I could magic a way to have all of my Australian friends over here as well, I'd do that in a heartbeat. But it's just adjusting to living on the other side of the world. You know, you you have weekly calls with your with your parents, you know, and I feel in some way we're more in touch with them here than we were back at home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that makes sense. And the same with our friends as well, you know. So, yeah. Well, I guess it's just a matter of, like, choosing your heart. Like, life is kind of going to be difficult no matter which route you choose, but it's like which which hard is a more fulfilling hard because there's like the hard of yeah drowning out your life for five days a week but then there's the hard of like but I'm actually passionate about this and and I want it to work and what what reminded me of when you said that is you know I had a friend too who I spent last summer in Switzerland working at a hostel and those three months like I I got home back to the states and I like laid in my bed and I was just like hmm like was that a fever dream? Did, did any of that, did any of that happen? I I don't know. Um, but like you're saying, I mean, I think I've experienced that as well as like, no matter how many times I leave, I come back and everything is the same. Like my job was there for me, my friends, Mm. my family. I was just like, I could literally go back into the exact same life I was living. And I, that's just such a weird experience. Like, I I still don't know how to feel about that. Yeah, I'm the same. And like I said, the biggest thing for me, which I still, I don't know that I would say struggle with, is I feel I have changed. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting. And I think I think that's forced solitude. I'm an extrovert. So for 18 months, I couldn't be the normal extrovert that I was. Mm-hmm. I went into a pretty dark space in Ireland because of that. Then when we finally moved to France, you know, we moved to France on our bikes. We took the ferry from Dublin, landed at Cherbourg in Normandy, right at the very tip of northern France and cycled all the way down south to the Pyrenees. And that was a magical time of amazing freedom. It felt like freedom. You know, I was on my bike, you know, I was just like that little kid that had learned how to ride and escape from the nature strip and and, and go further than I could have gone. And, you know, 
having lived in restrictive lockdowns where FYI, we were living right on the Irish Sea. So our even our five kilometre radius, half of that was the water of the Irish Sea. So we couldn't even have our full circle to enjoy it from exercise point of view. But when we finally came down to the Pyrenees, because I had had that headspace, I um I decided I needed a goal and a challenge. And I got involved and signed up for a event it was called the Normandy Cat 900, which is an ultra distance cycling event. And uh, if you have listeners who don't know what that is, it's where people get on bikes and do stupid, crazy distances in crazy small amounts of time with no sleep and 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 ridiculousness. And it was something I had watched as a passionate fan and supporter. And I guess you we watch people on Instagram and social media and the like, and you know you follow people, so you see your echo chamber coming back to you, and it normalizes things. But I decided I needed something as a goal to push myself on and I signed up for this event and had six months worth of training, which meant to do something of this nature takes a significant amount of your time to train. And when I say that, I mean 20-hour training weeks on the bike, at least minimum for five and a half months of that. I did some crazy distances that I, I look back on last year and think, how did I do that? But the reason I'm bringing that up and why I think it's relevant to how I feel about my recent experience in Australia is I spent so much of that time riding my bike solo and alone. In Australia, I would do some of my riding on my own, but most of it was social. And riding is a social thing in Australia. You ride with your friends, you go somewhere amazing, you stop sometimes halfway at a bakery, you have, you know, some sort of coffee and cake, you finish, you might end with coffee and cake. It's, you know, you're riding your bike, but you're there as a social thing. And my riding flipped here in France to me all of a sudden riding on my own, having spent the majority of my time living overseas only with my husband and riding and being on my own. And I feel that's had such a distinct impact in shaping what my personality is like now. And that's been interesting to reflect back on and and something that is quite unexpected. I think I reflect on moments more differently. I reflect on situations probably more differently. I value my friendships that I have immensely and think of my friends fondly so much. But it's been interesting to see just how much I've changed. Mm -hmm. And so you, I think you said it took you 66 hours to finish this this race yeah. I yeah, actually this- I looked I looked into this because I don't know I don't know a lot about cycling I don't know a lot about I'm training for a marathon right now um, oh that's but, amazing too <laughs> sorry yeah, I mean I love I <laughs> love running I do but I the only the most biking I've really done is within little triathlons that I like to do but I never train for the biking I, I don't know what it is but I I just because like, I'm like, oh, well, the bike will take me, you know, (laughs) but it's hard. It is hard. Um, but I find like something about cycle touring. I have a friend right now that's like starting to get into it. And the more I hear about it, the more I'm just like, this is so cool. Like, this is great because it's not hiking. So it doesn't take me as long, but it's not driving. And I hate driving cars. Like as an American, I, I suffer on a daily basis because I'm like, I have to take my car literally everywhere. Mm. Um, And so this idea of like getting into biking sounds so appealing, um, but like, I don't know much about it. So like, what, what is the process of like training for this? Or like when you go, when you have these people that are wanting to come and do cycle tours, like, do you have people that are very beginner that are, you know, like I've never done a cycle trip before. And like, how do you kind of, prepare someone yeah definitely and I guess there's two different sides so cycle touring I think is the perfect flow travel like you said I mean hiking is amazing and I love hiking because you see so much more because you're going through a landscape so much slower but it's not fast so if you've got a week's holiday and you're hiking you're seeing a really small space in that week time Mm -hmm. cycle touring your distances expand to your fitness level and your terrain to some degree. But most people, you know, if you, and for a holiday purpose, you can be spending, you know, five hours of riding a day, covering whatever distance your fitness can allow you to cover. But the environment 
you're watching that landscape change as you pedal. You're still hearing everything around you. You're smelling. You're visually seeing the landscape and the architecture and the things change as well. So you get this amazing immersive sensory experience on the bike. And the cycle touring we've done, we've done, you know, a lot of it recently has been camping as well. So we are fully outdoors a lot of the time. And that has been an amazing thing. And it it is open to all fitness levels. And I think that's the great thing about it is that you don't need to have done this pre-certification cycling course to all of a sudden qualify you to be able to do a cycle tour. It just might impact on potentially how much discomfort it might be for the first few days or potentially just what distances you want to cover. But there's no rule book that says you have to be on your bike for five hours. You could cycle to her and, and, you know, ride an hour in the morning, stop for lunch, ride an hour in the afternoon and get to a different spot if that's what you wanted to do. And that could be a great beginner step for you. I always say if people want to dabble in cycle touring, pick a weekend, pick somewhere that's different from what you know and and find a way to cycle there, stay overnight and cycle back. And that gives you a great feeling for what you can expect, which is great. The difference between cycle touring and ultra distance cycling is it's, it's like, it's like ultra cycling. It's like cycle touring, but like on fast forward and in truly immersive because your senses, are, because, um, so I guess to help with your listeners, the event I did, it was called Normandy Cat 900. I didn't realise when I signed up that the event actually had a official finishing time limit. So to be deemed an official finisher, I had to finish this this distance and this ride within 73 hours. And the distance of the ride, Normandy Cat 900 gives you a clue because 900 kilometres is the general distance that you'll have to do. And I say general because there's another element to the event that I did in that it it involved connecting eight checkpoints that were dotted around the department of Normandy in northern France and then a few that sort of went into neighbouring departments as well. It was fully self-supported. You had to map your own route, decide which way you're going to connect the checkpoints, decide which way you're going to do the whole thing. No outside assistance is allowed whatsoever. If your bike breaks, you have to fix it. You have to get your own food. You can't have someone meet you somewhere and give you anything. Like you are wholly and solely responsible for yourself. And in order to do a distance that much, like my route was 900 and I think when I mapped it, it was 904 kilometres, which I thought was pretty good. But I, um, during my tiredness, took a couple of wrong turns. So by the time I got to the finish, I think I was around 913, 914 kilometres. In order to do that in 70, within 73 hours, it's not that you have to travel at high speeds, but you have to spend so much of every single day on your bike cycling. And when I say it doesn't mean high speeds, it's because generally people who do really well in ultra events, they do really well because they learn how to eat food on the move. So you might stop and resupply, but you're not generally stopping and resupplying and having an hour for lunch. You're stopping. I would say during my event, I would have stopped on average for resupply maybe for half an hour to to sit down for foods during those two and a bit days, but most of my food was eaten on the bike. You've got to navigate. You've got to be aware of things. You've got to be aware of where you're going to sleep. How long are you sleeping for? Eight hours is a luxury that you do not have if you're an ultra cyclist. The event I did started at 10 o'clock at night. FYI, I did not know it was going to start at freaking 10 o'clock at night when I signed up. I didn't know there was a time limit and I didn't know it was a nighttime departure. Mm -hmm. And I was freaked out about that because that involves riding through a night and in the dark. And my experience of riding at nighttime was back in Australia, meeting a really dear friend of mine early in the mornings. We would ride and maybe the first 45 minutes to an hour would be in the dark. But I was in city lights, with lit up streets with our own lights for that factor. I wasn't in the middle of the French countryside in places I didn't know. And I didn't have to do that for eight full hours. But um, I did it. <laughs> um, I rode the very first day. I rode throughout the night, did not stop, 
by the time I eventually stopped late the next evening, I had ridden 385 kilometres, uh, which okay. was crazy. <laughs> and, and yeah, the next day got progressively harder because of that. <laughs> um, but I had to back that up again and had to see whether I had gained the fitness through my six months of training to be able to do that. And everything takes so much more thinking and so much more effort and it's cliche, and this will be something that you'll know with your training with your marathon, and I know it's different distances, but you get to a stage where something will be hurting physically. If your head's okay, you'll be able to keep going. If something's hurting physically and your mind's not in it and your mind wants to stop, that's you done. So it's all about the head. Mm -hmm. I got the day before, hours before the event, I had a problem on my bike, and this is like, I'm about to set off on this ridiculous escapade and my bike's broken. Like, what am I going to do? Now, thankfully, this is before the event, so I could go to a bike store. Went and they tried to fix my setup. They they gave me a little bit of a hack, which would get me through, but it was sceptical whether it would hold for the entire event. Thankfully, it did. But the best bit of service that I got from that bike shop visit was the mechanic telling me a French saying, which is, Commencer avec les jambes, finir avec la tête. And that means you'll start with the legs, but you're going to finish with the head. And I thought of that so many times during this event because it was true. My head had to be screwed on to get to that finish line. I had a few wobbles, but thankfully I got there. Um, and, yeah, 66 hours and 12 minutes, I think, is my official finishing time, which was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that takes some serious mental strength because once you get to a certain point physically, it's like it, it is a mental, a mental game after that. But I'm curious, like, so you have all these little setbacks, you have these moments of like, what am I going to do? I mean, you don't seem like someone that's just going to give up super easily. How do you kind of navigate those difficult situations and be like, like, no matter what, this is going to, it's just going to happen no matter how it happens. I think there's times where you don't realise you're navigating it, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. I think there's times where it's, well, this is the situation and I just have no choice. I've just got to get through it. You know, lockdown in Ireland, that really sucked. Yeah. Did I want to navigate that? No. Did I have a choice? No. And you just have to, you just have to do, you have to get up every day. You have to make a plan for what's going to move you forward. You have to have a goal and have that focus towards it. And it has to be something that you believe in. I couldn't still be on this side of the world if I didn't believe in the dream of being on this side of the world and if I wasn't passionate about why I'm here. I couldn't do what I'm doing now in order to be in a job like I was back in Australia. That that just would not happen. I'm passionate about what I do now. I love cycling. I love being able to give people those experiences that I have and it comes out in that enthusiasm and that's what allows me to get through. So there's times where I feel you don't have a choice but to get through. When you do have a choice, I guess it's about having I think you and be resilient and get through it are worth it. Oh, okay. Do you want me to when yeah, did I, I freeze? Think you, I think you froze. You said I think it's about and then a little freeze. Oh, okay. I can I can go back. Um <laughs> What should I go back for? Let me think. So, okay, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just repeat, and you'll see if you edit it incorrectly. Yeah, How's that no, sound? Yeah. Okay. So, I, I think there's times where you have no choice but to get through stuff. You have to. You are in the situation. You have no option, and you've just got to grin and get through it. But when you do have a choice, I think what's going to get you through is the over overwhelming feeling that you're passionate about what your goal at the end of this finish line is going to be. And I don't mean a finish line in terms of an event, but I mean, you know, in terms of a living and a house life here, for example, in terms of a future here in France, for me personally, I couldn't be here if I was doing my old job, for example. I need to be passionate about what's brought me here and I need to be 100% positively on board with my why and my purpose for being here as well. 
just saying that makes me a little bit icky because it reminds me of facilitating human resource employee wellbeing sessions and telling people <laughs> this in my old role. And I've used buzzwords, which I don't, I hope is not too, having too much into your listeners, but it's, it's a hundred percent true. You need to be passionate behind your goals. I, I needed to have that belief in me of why I need to be resilient is because of this and knowing that it's going to struggle, but it's going to, I I can get it out of the other side and I can be a stronger person for it. And I will be proud of what I've achieved and I will be thankful for it in 10 years time looking in the rear view mirror because I did it. Mm -hmm. I guess when I have the option of returning back, I will want to take that option wondering what if I want to leave my all my what if cards and burn all my matches out here before I ever take my get out of jail card if that makes sense no it it definitely does so I do have a question though about how do you how do you feel about when people say you need to pick like this one thing because here you are training for this ultra cycling but then you're also trying to build a business and you're also renovating your house and you have all these things so how do you kind of balance that in your day-to-day life and how do you kind of move each needle forward when you know that like like obviously I think your business is probably at the forefront of what you're trying to do so do you believe that you they, there can be balance and that you can achieve multiple things at once I think you need to have balance in order to achieve things okay. if they if you're at balance nothing can get achieved and what I mean by that is there are times where you have to put so much effort and focus solely on one thing but you've all in life we always have to juggle balls and spin plates it's it's an always thing because there's always going to be scenarios that didn't exist you know last week that exist now that are going to and you I guess in a way you have to shift and um and pivot if it's anything my ultra distance cycling experience has probably helped me become a bit more resilient because you have to be good at problem solving to get through those events, especially when it's a self-supported event. You can't take outside assistance. You are your own problem solver and you yourself are the person with the skills that's going to get you from A to B to the finish line. And I guess enduring and going through that's made me realize what I can put up with and what I can do and what I am capable of physically yeah and mind you I don't quite have the fitness that I did this time last year but I know that I could get that back if I was dedicated enough for that type of goal I could do that but mentally going through that experience can only change you for the better Uh, Mm -hmm. in realising what you're capable of. And I guess mentioning earlier all that time spent on my own training, it took a while in the early months to enjoy that experience. But after I realised how important it was for me and now that's something that still occurs and whether it's I need to make sure that the way that I schedule my day is hours spent on the business, on the website, in calls with clients, doing things, preparing for the cycling season. But I always have to allow myself that time for myself, which is so important, which allows me to go on my bike and escape for two hours or go on a hike for two hours or be in my garden, which I love for two hours, or take my camera with me and actually, you know, be the passionate photographer that I am for a few hours And that's, I guess to use a cliche, that's the equivalent of applying fertilizer on a plant. But for me, that's the way that I continue to be able to do things and to multitask. I think spreading yourself too thin, too many things, do that without a reset. But you do realize, am I... Am you I froze back? for like a second, yeah, but it's okay. Okay. Uh, spreading yourself too thin isn't good and trying to do too many things one on top of the other, you're going to drop a plate and you have to be prepared for that. But I think provided you know what energizes you and prioritizing making sure that you give yourself that energy, whether it's daily or weekly or every few days, whatever it is, that's the most important thing. 
in being able to continue to endure and to be able to to do these things that you do whether it's you know forging ahead on a new corporate career if that's what you love doing that's you need to find that energy for yourself somehow and find out what what gives you that internal fertilizer for for lack of a better analogy Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. no I I love that that's that's great because I you know I just refuse to believe that you know I I can't sleep seven hours a night in order to accomplish my dreams and that I can't you know I, I just refuse to believe that narrative um so it's just really a nice thing to hear it when when other people kind of agree with that it's interesting actually because so part of what I do I have started a podcast called Seek Travel Ride as well yes. and in that I share the stories and experiences of people who have undertaken amazing adventures on a bike so there's two things there one I'm passionate about that space so as a host it's it's not a job for me to interview people about this yeah. because I love hearing their stories it's like that's part of my own little fertilizer now for lack of a better word I need to move away from the fertilizer theme. I think <laughs> no, that's I sort of it. an, in, I think it's an insight into the fact that I love my garden. But anyway, <laughs> um, but, but part of that show is I've met some amazing guests who've done incredible things and I've been able to get an insight into what's make them do things. And one of my guests is a neuroscientist, uh, Dr. Florence Cattell. And I, when I got back to Australia, was fortunate enough to spend some time with her face to face. Very much until a few months ago so this was like the biggest silver lining gift to plug into her neuroscience mentality of positivity and mindset more than anything else and just how powerful having the right mindset is but something that she said to me which resonated is her current work at the moment is a whole heap of research based on burnout and burnout in people and quite quitting in a She's passionate about it because she has oh, to say herself froze. am i am i good oh you froze i i need to find a better way to record i'm so sorry would you mind that's me? okay where where did i do you remember what i last you said, said her her she's working on a new study about okay so and Florence currently is working on research about people who have experienced burnout and in a corporate sense it's termed quite quitting and her research is fascinating but the reason that she's doing it is because she herself has experienced this and she she loves research she loves her job she loves studying and she experienced it when she was full-time at university doing many many hours on a side job also volunteering um you know for 15 hours a week on top of her job on top of her university on top of all the extra research and study she was doing as well and initially Florence told herself well something's got to give and what gave her Florence was sleep and she just didn't let herself sleep for you know, she'd go a few days and not sleep. She'd sleep on very little hours. But the interesting thing and why this is relevant is, as she said, she's realised as a neuroscientist, that's not healthy and it's not healthy for you as a human. And you need to actually, there's a reason why we need sleep in our lives and you get the best out of yourself when you do sleep. So totally allow yourself seven hours of sleep a day is what I'm getting at because you need that. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, and Everyone, oh, you remember when I was talking about those long haul flights? Mm -hmm. I don't sleep on planes. Oh, there's not enough coffee in the world that allows my body to reset over that fatigue. It takes days to finally get back into the right circadian rhythm and mix for it. So, you know, I think, you know, sleep is everyone's fertilizer, just to come back to that lovely term. <laughs> hey, I, I love the garden terminology. I think that's. <laughs> great I think everyone should have a garden to be honest it's just such a intimate experience growing your own food and then eating it so oh I love it I love it and we're in spring here in France as you would be in the U.S. and it's like you know when everything all of a sudden stops being brown and things are flowering and things are green and bursting forth and birds have returned and you know days are getting longer it's a bright time sorry to all my Australian friends because you're at the other end of that cycle but Right. We've gone through winter and we, we, I'm embracing it. Oh my gosh. Yes. I'm so ready for summer. I cannot wait. Um, 
I do want to be respectful of your time though. So do you have anything exciting coming up that you would like to share? And then anything else you want to just say about your business, where we can find you? Yeah. So I guess my business is, called, uh, you know, our business, this is me and my husband, it's called Seek Travel Ride and you can find us, it's online at seektravelride.com. And as I said, if if you're someone who has thought about taking an active holiday and a cycling holiday in France and have wondered about how to do that, go to the website, take advantage of all the free information there. And if you want to speak with, I guess, the experts of people who live here and cycle here and know this country really well, then reach out to us and we can help you help plan your trip. I guess things that are coming up for me that I'm excited about uh, you know, it's summer season, it's cycling season. So showing people around and, and actually having guests here in the Pyrenees to show around and, and take on these cycling adventures is something that I'm really enthusiastic for. And if it's that something that you want to do, definitely get in touch. Uh, you'll have a English speaking guide who is really passionate at telling you about the local sites and stuff that you'll see that you would otherwise go, wow, that's nice. But if you want some more detail behind it, that's what I'm here for. Uh, but also I'm really passionate about my podcast and yes. if you want to hear about people adventuring in a different way, then you know, I encourage you to to tune in. It's called Seek Travel Ride. It's on all your favourite podcast playing apps. If you just put it in there, you'll, it'll come up. And whilst there is, yes, there is an over resounding cycling theme, all my guests have a story of where they went to on their bike and it's different things. Some of them are ultra cyclists. Some of them are cycle tourers. Some of them are breaking world records, but whilst the bike is the common element, I can tell you overwhelmingly from my listeners and myself, what makes these stories worth listening to is the human interest stuff behind it. It's the people's why, why did they do something? What brought them here? That is just amazing and fascinating and was something unexpected to me. I didn't even realize it myself until I started it. I have had some incredible guests do some incredible things. You know, I've had someone who was, you know, 40 years as a painter, like an artist painting intricate paintings. All of a sudden overnight their life changed for them because they suffered a stroke and they lost the vision in in one of their eyes, which meant they all of a sudden couldn't paint anymore. And all of a sudden they want to maximise the remaining amount of vision by travelling on a bike slowly enough through the world to see everything out there. You know, these are the sort of stories that I just love hearing about. Mm -hmm. And it's stories that aren't by famous people that everyone would know. Like you sort of think I need to be interviewing famous people to be popular. And if it's anything, it's like I don't want to interview famous people. I want to interview normal people doing incredible things because that's so much more inspiring for me. So get on board seek travel ride my name's bella malloy you'll find me on all your channels under that and uh yeah i hope you enjoy listening and, and want to follow along on this journey oh yes thank you so much that was incredible like i can i can feel your passion for this and it's just like i like it was funny because yesterday i don't know if you ever get like this but like I'll record a podcast or something and then I'll be like, why? like sometimes you're like, well, like, why am I doing this? Like, am, am I that? And then you do it. And I'm like, but I like, I love this. Like, this is so fun. And I just hearing your story is incredible. And it's, I will be checking you out when I come to you <laughs> for my first. Oh my gosh, definitely. Actually, you know what you'll love? This part of France, the language that they learn is Spanish. So <laughs> you'll be able to practice. I need it's to actually, start- it's actually <laughs> something it's actually something that I didn't realize was a, was a, I don't know if I would call it a unconscious bias. And it was an assumption that I had that was wrong. And my assumption was, I understood that moving to rural France, people probably wouldn't speak English, but my assumption was that older people wouldn't speak English, but younger people would surely be taught English as the language they're taught in French schools. And I would be able to speak with younger people fine. And I say that's an assumption because in the South of France, they are taught another language at school, but they're taught Spanish or Italian <laughs> and it's not English. So I'm not saying there aren't schools in France that don't teach English and certainly in Paris they'll teach English and, and you know, there they might be multiple languages taught and children can learn different languages. But here in the South, they don't teach English. So the idea that you can go and find someone that speaks English too 
in a small village is is not happening. And to some degree is probably better for my language learning experience. <laughs> so, you know, but yeah, it's an interesting thing. So yeah, come to this part of France and you'll be able to use your Spanish. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm actually headed to Switzerland um, again this year. I'm going to go work on a little organic farm. So when you were talking about gardening, oh, right. I was like, oh, um, well, last summer I just, I fell in love with living in Switzerland and that's that's actually where I signed up for my marathon as well I was like if I'm gonna go back I'm gonna I'm gonna run the Jungfrau marathon oh Um, brilliant so I was like I'm just gonna go work at a farm all summer and then run a marathon and see where that takes me because I just want to stay over there um so I figure if I just keep going back they'll have someone will have to let me still be away exactly but you're chasing that dream and you know what is it about Switzerland that you love it's not even necessarily Switzerland it's just I mean it's just Europe in general like I like I said I I just don't love driving my car every day and I know that is such a like okay get over yourself like you can drive a car but you know I've lived in Madrid I lived in New Zealand actually for six months I lived in London for six months I um I traveled, yeah, I lived in Switzerland and I've just been to Europe so many times that like, I just love the culture. I love walking. I love being able to take public transportation and be like, okay, I'm in the mountains and I, you know, I can still have my day, but I can also like still be active. I can work. And I, it just feels, you know, like my days when I was in Madrid just felt so long, like days just felt anyways I just it's not necessarily Switzerland you know I I think I would happily move anywhere um Mm. I just yeah it's the piece of like figuring out what am I going to do when I get there and it's interesting another guest that I interviewed on my podcast Simon I mean he's in his mid-60s now Mm. and he wouldn't mind me saying that he's said it before many times and he has a life of adventure behind him like you know he's 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 you know done amazing hikes he's gone on an amazing cycle tours he's established he's six months hiking the pacific crest trail he's done amazing things and his thing is that these adventures aren't something he seeks out they seek him out and he find and they find him Mm -hmm. and i feel if you're passionate about something if you have your feelers out there it will find you. 10 years ago, I didn't think this life in France existed for me. It didn't exist for me. It wasn't something I thought of. I was expecting to go 10 years ago on a three-week holiday in France, and that would be that bucket list item done. Mm -hmm. If you have a passion for a a different cultural life, the, the how and the why will find you. You just need to have your feelers out as to that. I mean, hearing you talk about not driving a car, it resonates. We have so far resisted the urge to purchase a car. I have I have driven once in the last three and a half or twice in the last three and a half years, and that was on my return in Australia. I have not driven over here in Europe because I haven't needed to. There would be days where it would have been convenient to have a car, but it wasn't necessary. Maybe there's a car in my future, but I feel even if there is, the habits I've made now of walking and biking to places, we do our shopping commute with our bikes. Mm-hmm. I love it. It's you know, it's not a struggle for me. It's just a way of life. And coming from Australia, where we have an over resounding car culture, and living and understanding in a car, especially here in Europe, we have amazing train services that get us from A to B faster than a car would anyway. Why would I buy a car? And mm-hmm. I love that I don't need to over here. So. I'm all for you and I totally understand and resonate and hear every single bit that you're saying about that because it oh. it's a bit of unexpected thing that I didn't realise until I came here existed within me as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. And, I mean, you know, if we want this beautiful world to be beautiful, you know, in generations' time, people like us need to be making these decisions of ditching our cars and being more environmentally conscious and active with how we're going to be doing that as well. I feel there is hope because people are making these changes. But in Europe, I feel like it's so much more accelerated than it ever was back in Australia. And I don't know if you have the same perception coming from the US as well. Oh, yeah, 100%. I mean, everyone owns a car. Mm. So Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's multiple cars in a family. You drive multiple hours each week. Mm -hmm. Um, 
you know, you do long distances, you go on road trips. It's it's part of society and culture for sure. Yeah. And, in, you know, if you don't do it, you're a freak or you're abnormal or why are you doing <laughs> that? Like, <laughs> or yeah. are you poor and that's why you don't have a car? Like, you know, they're, they're, they're the sort of things that would come into place. Um, did you lose your license DUI? Like, like you know, and you're like, I'm rich because I don't have car payments every month. So, uh yeah exactly exactly no it's great it's great oh my gosh it's been energizing talking to you as well i'm yeah. going to keep my eyes peeled and see where you end up in europe and this organic farm sounds right, right up my alley yeah i'm i'm really i'm really excited about it i will definitely reach out because i've always wanted to do a cycle tour so if i have time i will be there um, oh absolutely and you can do it like i live in the mountains but not everywhere has to be hilly and you know what there's these great inventions called e-bikes now which no one should be ashamed of using because it just means that you get to go a little bit further into places which maybe were unattainable for you at some time. So, you know, I see yeah. people, you know, conquering Tour de France climbs now on e-bikes and if that's what gets them to the top, power to them. I think that's awesome. Yeah. Um, I do have two questions for you that I actually don't have to do with the podcast, but I'm wondering how do you record your podcast? Because I do... Oh, yeah, no, that's cool. I'm I happy do to stop using zoom because it does glitch out like this a lot um especially when people are like in another country cuts in and out. yeah yeah do you like so do you so do audio? i oh, no sorry. i do audio only but okay. i do conduct my interviews with video as well because i feel like people create rapport and it's more like a proper conversation that way yeah uh, i use it's a paid service so, you know, if, if you have to decide whether it's in your budget or not, I use Squadcast. Okay. Um, similar apps. So, like, I have a friend who uses Riverside and raves about it. What I liked about, and I, don't, I haven't looked into Riverside because Squadcast worked fine for me. What I like about it is that even, you know, when we've had these little, oh, no, you've stopped, you're paused. With Squadcast, that might happen because of poor internet connection, but because the audio is lo is recorded locally, at each person's machine there's no loss of file there it okay. might impact an interview in that you say oh sorry hang on let's do something again but you've actually always got that audio there and it downloads it as two separate WAV files as well well you can choose to download it as a WAV file or an mp3 file but that's what I've used anecdotally the worst internet I've actually struggled with is from people in Australia because okay. Australian internet is really crap <laughs> it's horrible but um and I've had some people in some remote places like Armenia or actually the highlands in Scotland or something like that and it's been a bit flaky but Squadcast has been 100% solid for me so I use Squadcast I you pay on an hourly like how many hours of recording do you want to use a month and I could okay. off the top of my head I can find out what my package is at the moment I update oh, a I weekly podcast my weekly, I do my recordings weekly and they're, each episode's generally just over an hour. So, mm -hmm. you know, I probably do five hours a month of recording. Okay. Um, well, actually, that's that's edited. So it's probably six or so hours a month, if that makes sense. But, yeah. But, no, I love Squadcast. And then for my editing, I used Audacity. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I, editing is fine. It's just the, the video. Cause I've been looking into Riverside and I've been looking into other ones, but like everyone says something different on the internet. And it's like, there's like 10 super bad reviews and then like five really, really good ones that I'm like, yeah. okay, I'm just going to start asking people that also have podcasts because yeah, I just don't know. So, um, there is potentially, if you want, I can have a look. I might, as a squadcaster, have like a free link for you to try or something if you want, because squadcast is audio as is, is visual as well. I just choose, not, and I have the option when I set my meetings up of whether I want to do audio only or visual and audio. And often I just do audio because I, that's all I'm using. Yeah. Um, but if I wanted to use visual as well, I've got the option there. And so if you want, I'm more than, I'll am i have a look into it. If I've got a way that you can access it for free, at least that way you can give it a try. Like like most places, it'll be try us free for seven days and then, you know, you've forgotten that you need to remove your credit card details and your membership starts. But yeah. 
from memory, Squadcast does have a free trial period as well. I'm pretty okay. sure. So, you know, why don't you just say, okay, I'm going to sign up, put a calendar invite to make sure that you ditch it if you don't like it. Yeah. And give it a go and see. Yeah. But yeah, that's I who I, I use. Um, I do have a friend. Her her um podcast is awesome. It's called Interview Boss. So she's in the HR space and her sister is as well. And um they're all about providing people's hacks about how to get job interviews and how to be successful at them and stuff like that. And uh, Sarah's 10 years younger than me. So um, so she's probably more in your, and her sister's younger than her. So, you know, in her in her mid to late twenties, it would be her sister. So probably in your audience age bracket as well. Um, mm-hmm. But she uses Riverside and she loves Riverside. Okay. And I think she does a visual podcast as well. It's called Interview Boss. So okay. if you want to check it out, you can see yeah. what I mean. I I yeah. love podcasts, so I will check it out. I hate, There's so many that I need to listen to all the time. So. Oh, I know. And it's like, and you know, that's part of my fertilizer is, you know, yeah. on my walk or something. I, it can't be something that I am. I can't listen to it while I'm working because yeah. – I, I, I can listen to music while I'm working, but I can't listen to podcasts. No, I get too um, invested. Yeah, 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 definitely. Or I miss it. Actually, someone, it was a big tip for my ultra was for riding through the night because I was, you know, working through my anxieties of how I was going to do that. And one of them was to listen to podcasts in the night as opposed to music because podcasts, when you're listening to them, you feel like you're part of a conversation. So you're tricking your mind into believing that you're not on your own. Oh. And that really, really worked. So if you ever, um, if, you, if, if your marathon works for you and you go into the ultra marathon space or trail yeah. running, that might be something for you to pick up your sleeve. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the goal, honestly. So we'll see. But okay, awesome. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> like seriously, until until you sign up, you you'll find reasons not to. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you sign up, you'll have those holy shit the pants moments. But we you, you make it happen that way, you know. Yeah. Um, I had too many wines at a Toulouse Christmas market and signed up for this ultra event with six months training, and uh, it I actually didn't believe I could finish it even when I got to the start line I thought uh, I've got no idea how this is going to happen and it was funny after the fact one of my good friends said to me um because I did uh, without wanting to sound too proud of myself I did actually quite well and I was first female race it as opposed to just thinking I was racing it I was just never confident that I was going to get to the finish line within the time frame. And so I kept myself from stopping too much because I had this fear that even when I was 30 kilometres from the finish that I would have this ride-ending mechanical on my bike that would take hours to fix. And if I had hours up my sleeve, then at least that would give me a chance. And so it was like putting time in the bank that I might need to withdraw and deposit later or withdraw later. Um, that you'll find ways of making it happen if it's just like oh that's the goal just sign up <laughs> yeah I'm not well, saying kind of... don't do the marathon do an ultra but like your, your marathon is a stepping stone to doing it so you know <laughs> yeah well that's kind of the the how the marathon happened is because I've gotten injured like I was planning on doing a marathon last uh, summer you... yeah yeah oh, can you hear me okay I was planning on doing yeah, a marathon yeah, no, last I can hear summer you. And then I got a stress fracture in like both my feet. And so then I didn't. You are in a moon this, boot for ages then. I know. And I was like, you know what? Okay, this year, like I'm going to do it. And so the second I found out that this woman was like, you can come to the farm. I didn't even look at the course, didn't look at anything. I was just like, I'm just going to sign up for this because I have to do it. And like, there you go. Saying, and you're going to make it happen. Well, and I didn't know that there was a time limit either. So I'm kind of. Oh my gosh. What's your time <laughs> limit? I don't think it's that much. It's like the race closes. So you have like four, I think it's like three or four hours to get to the the certain rest stop and then another certain hours to get to the next one. And if you don't hit those points on the times, then you can't continue. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I think it's like six hours, uh, like four, four and a half hours at the first mark, 
five and a half hours at the second mark. And then I think something like that, but it's, it's mind you, it's like up a mountain. So for um, like, it's kind of long. For a marathon, it's pretty, yeah. So how much elevation is there in this? Do you know? Like, cause it... <laughs> I don't know. Um, Right now I'm training like kind of flat. And then when I get there, I'll start my like mountain Hill running and stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. Like, yeah. But I mean, I don't know. I kind of feel like the less I know, the better. The better. I don't know. I have a friend who's like that. I have a friend. And actually, I interviewed someone on the podcast that was like that as well. They'd signed up for like a seven-day, multi-day charity ride through the state of New York. And they didn't want to know the route, the distance, the elevation or anything because, and that was mentally, they didn't want to psych themselves out. Yeah. Whereas for my ultra, I had this list in my head as an anxious person and suffering from anxiety and stuff as well. I had this list of anxieties in my head that I had already needed to problem solve and figure out solutions to before I got to the start line. So, oh my gosh, what happens if my oh well, then you have another bike light. Okay, oh my gosh, what happens if my bicycle trip computer dies on me and how will I navigate? Oh well, you've actually got the navigation software on your phone and this is how you'll mount it and that's how you do it. And I actually had to do that because it was pouring with damn rain on that first night. It was horrible, and the touch screen on my trip computer for my bike totally whacked out and broke on me and so I couldn't navigate from it anymore and so I had to use my backup plans and it was because I'd already problem solved them it wasn't a problem anymore I'd had the solutions ready to go and so yeah so it's interesting different people's approaches yeah I mean Um, I think for this maybe that would be my approach but I think like the second I do finish this marathon would be the time that I'm like okay I'm signing up for an ultra um and I probably would prepare for that maybe just a little bit more. I'd probably be like, okay, yeah. let's at least know a before little bit. Before I know it, before I know it, I'll be saying that you'll you'll send me a message and say, Bella, I've signed up for the uh, Mont Blanc Trail Ultra Run. <laughs> That's oh my ridiculous. God. I oh, know. my God. That one. Oh. Have you been to Chamonix? I oh, haven't. Now. Oh, my God. I mean, you've been to Switzerland and everything is beautiful there as well, but Chamonix is like, whoa, there is, you know, there's like, glaciers coming down into the village uh it is just the mountains on steroids um Mm -hmm. it's very different it's funny though because see for me the Pyrenees and I've been to the Alps not back in time but they're a bit more familial and a bit more rustic and not as commercial and I think it's because they're not as close to major European city centers so Mm -hmm. There is still tourism here, don't get me wrong, but it's not to the level that it is in the in the French Alps or the Italian Alps or the Swiss Alps. It's just a little bit different, and I feel it's just a little bit more chill. Yeah. Our mountains don't go quite as high, but there's still a few 3,000-metre peaks here, and uh, the road goes up to 2,000 metres often enough, and when you're on a bike, that's high enough. <laughs> um, yeah. And my hiking trails, I have a mountain that goes literally to the back of our house. And the hiking trail in it goes up a gradient of like 30%. And it you're like you're literally zigzagging your way to the top, thinking, I don't want to fall off here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, trail running is something I'd love to get into. I did some running when we were back in Australia because I was away from my bike and I thought, well, I've wanted to get into trail running. This is a great opportunity. But um, I tried to do too much too soon and gave myself really bad patella tendonitis. So that uh, trail running career ended very quickly. Um, The thing that concerns me is I've got really unstable ankle ligament joints Mm -hmm. and like running maybe isn't the best thing I could do for them. But for me, I'd like to get to a stage where I could incorporate trail running maybe on the uphills or some of the peaks but I would probably always, always, always be walking on the downhills anyway. Um, it's just, yeah, even with hiking poles, I feel like it's just an, a, re- a recipe for disaster for me. Yeah, and I mean, I've always had pretty tough knees. So like it was, it's definitely something that I've tried to be more mindful of. And that's why like I've been training since January, but I'm still only at like 10 miles. i have not like, I'm going very slowly with this training because I'm like, I have until September um, and yeah. I'm trying my best to like keep myself strong and not injured. Um, so I'm going to start ramping up training a little bit more now that summer is coming. But I was like in the winter, I can't run in the mountains anyways. So yeah. And, you know, I was just thinking 
because obviously there's an element where your marathon running goes and tips over your cardio into that endurance phase, right? Mm-hmm. Where your body's just doing, and it's all like the important thing is eat when you're not hungry, drink when you're not thirsty, always have some calorie form. But for your recovery and your training period, and the thing that I introduced that I've never done in my cycling before and made such a big difference, one of my good friends, her PhD research is in sports nutrition and about endurance athletes. And it was actually looking specifically about um, natural food sources as fueling. So instead of sports gels, like pureed apple and stuff like that. But she got me onto proper recovery nutrition in that when I ended a long training ride and got home within that first hour, I needed to make sure I took in 25 grams of protein and Mm. some form of carbohydrates as well. And that I swear makes such a difference. And I said to her, is this placebo? Because the next day I'm able to do this again. She goes, it's not. It just allows your muscles to recover. So I don't know if you're already doing that. And if you are, Bella, don't worry, I'm all on top of it. But otherwise, <laughs> um, I couldn't encourage you more than to to get on board the protein train. It is amazing. Yeah, I was a vegan for a while and that was not helpful for anything. Uh, yeah, that'd be really, really hard. Funnily <laughs> enough, I interviewed another actual ultra cyclist, Nikki Ray, for my podcast and She's vegan as well, although not with cake, which I thought was hilarious. So, <laughs> yeah. So, 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 uh, so, yeah. She, she, she tries to stick to a vegan diet, but not with cake. And, and finally, well, I'm thinking. Of, I have a, 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 a lady called Leanne, an ultra, another ultra distance cyclist. She just finished the. Atlas Mountain Race, which is an ultra distance cycling event through Morocco. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, She's vegan and during the course mid race had to make the decision did she want to finish this event or scratch? And it depended on her being comfortable with not being vegan halfway through the event because pretty much in Morocco, the only thing on offer in a lot of these remote places are omelets, which are egg based. Mm -hmm. And she tried to go without and wasn't fueling properly and really suffered in the early part of her time. But then had to make a different, you know, a rational thought in her head of what she could do and to get through it. So, yeah, I could only imagine what struggle it would be Yeah, trying to work out that type of fueling nutrition. Like it, 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 I know people who have done it, Mm -hmm. but it's just, I don't want that complexity there. Um, Yeah. I've never gone full tilt at being vegan. And funnily enough, personally, I would say probably five or six days a week I'm vegetarian. Like yeah. I, I don't eat a lot of meat, but I do still eat some. I could probably I could probably go full vegetarian, probably pescatarian. I'd probably want to still have fish. Uh, but vegetables are my thing. I love them. So, you know, yeah. but I, I would miss eggs and milk um a lot. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think for me it was like, okay, I could just be more conscious. Like I don't have to, exactly. it doesn't have to be one way or the other. Like I don't have to eat meat six times a, a day or six times a week. Uh, yeah. Or, and that's so. exactly my sort of decision. And and again, for environmental reasons as well, Um, you know, and I feel it's the same with driving a car and I'm so sorry. We've been talking gas bag. No, I have nowhere to be. <laughs> um, okay. But it's the same with driving a car. It's sort of like, um, if everyone makes these decisions to take less trips across the board, everyone will be happier. And it's funny when I was saying how anecdotally Europe's so much further ahead than, say, Australia. Australia is still only just had the discussion with itself that climate change even exists. <laughs> Europe, it's existed for a, a, the best part of a decade or so. Mm-hmm. And the discussion that they're having with electric vehicles is electric vehicles aren't the future. No vehicles are the future. And they're trying to transition people away from cars full stop. In Australia, they're, try- they're still trying to convince people just to go electric. So... Um, it's interesting being on that different plane of, you know, of where people are and their thoughts, similar to me feeling like I've changed, but people haven't, it's the same, just witnessing this different cultural perspective as well. Yeah. I mean, the U S is right there with you that climate I change, know. I don't think climate change exists here yet. So no, it's, <laughs> well, it does in some States and actually yeah. it was a podcast, which gave me hope for the world. And it was, I think it was like an NPR podcast. My gosh, it must have been like eight years ago when I listened to it. Um, I wonder if it still even exists. And it was 
interviewing mayors in different cities in the US and realising that at that level, lots of change can actually take place and that when federally or even at a state level, things are roadblocked, shit can get done if the right people locally want to get shit done. And I love that. And I think in the states too, there's pro- there's definitely more progressive states than others. Mm-hmm. Um, the political scene there is an absolute minefield. Like, actual- I don't even understand it. I like I try so hard. Like, I was a journalism major, and mm. like I studied the news, and I'm like, I still don't understand what is happening. So it's fine. No, it's and it's and the the fact that there's certain things that are politicized like that even blows my mind like you know um like abortion is such a political minefield of a topic and you know those sort of things gun control like I just don't understand it um and I don't think I ever will like I just I I I remember last year when the abortion rules were passed I just felt so sad um Mm -hmm. that you know progressiveness in a in a country which used to hold itself forward for being progressive all of a sudden was becoming not progressive and sorry I actually don't know your political leaning so I'm making a lot of assumptions about you but no no um, no no no. I am I am like so I don't I guess I don't lean highly one way or the other mm. because it's just such a slippery slope like I'm like I'm very open to discussing and talking and whatever anyone believes that's fine. I just don't care. I'm like, as long as you believe it and you can like back up, give me reasons. And like, that's what you believe. That's great. But like, don't try to make me believe something that I don't believe, Mm. you know, like I'm very much a hundred percent, a hundred percent. But there are people that will, that seem so impassioned about this that are just like, whoa, Um, which I just can't understand. Uh, And I, we don't grow up with that sort of, political atmosphere in Australia and funnily enough it is something in French culture where people do have political discussions in French and can look quite animated about it but it's actually fine to have animated discussions with friends about it which I think is quite cool it's not a taboo topic if that makes sense and remember when I said how I was speaking and I met up with um, the neuroscientist Florence because she is French originally and she said it was something that struck her when she was in Australia is that it's almost at an educated level during our schooling system that we're taught that it's okay to just be subpar and not to think and not to challenge things and not have a zest for learning. And she had to adjust to that, that that was the way things were. And it's interesting because I feel very much that being the case, that education sort of watered down and dumbed down and um, it's more a business in Australia than actually educating for our future. I don't know what it's like in the States, but certainly in Australia it's that way. So this is not for the podcast. This is Bella. This is our chill no, chat. I, yeah. <laughs> I won't I won't put this in there. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's I think it's quite similar. Like I think um asking questions is not something that's often encouraged like I think I was afraid to ask questions for a very long time and being like wait but like why is it like this like why Mm -hmm. what who who decided that this is how life was and it's it's quite hard because I just don't think a lot of people ask that question and they don't want to or know why yeah and it's it's fine to be in my bubble and I don't need to question things and stuff like that whereas yeah I think it's good to be curious and and good to wonder and good to maybe push back and and question motives and stuff too sometimes as well so yeah. yeah anyway this has been a really fun chat um I probably should get off the call and, and look at making dinner it's like 20 to 7 here now but um yes. <laughs> hopefully you'll edit a, a, a worthy podcast out of this so oh it'll um, be so worthy um I will send you an email a dm whenever it, I think it'll be like two weeks from now that it'll come out um, cool 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 yeah. I'm, I'm not I'm not I'm not fast like in the future whenever it is that's all cool um awesome. it, it's funny like my schedule I think I interview when I finally get there like I'm, I'm I've sort of got to a stage where I got too far ahead um interview and I had to interview them in a certain time frame so yeah <laughs> Really well and if you've got any podcasting questions and stuff throw them at me I feel like you've been podcasting longer than I have so maybe you know maybe I'll have some questions for you as well <laughs> yeah I mean I started my podcast in January of 2022 so it's been oh wow you're like a year, year ahead of me yeah, yeah but wow I mean, congratulations I was, 
I was just doing it for fun though so like a lot of the like technology pieces a lot of the like formality of it I just was like I'm just doing this for fun like I would record on the top of a mountain with my friend it was very informal um yeah and so now I'm kind of like okay I actually love this like maybe I should take it a little more seriously so yeah as as seriously as I can be so it's one of those things you just allow yourself like anything that you do each time you do it you get better there's yeah. something, you know, I listened to my episode one. I don't cringe listening to it. I still think I did a pretty good first episode. Yeah. There's some slight things that I would do now with sound to get rid of some background noise and stuff like that. Or there's different ways that I prep my guests and stuff like that as well. And, um, you know, the balancing of the sound and the audio is something that I really paid a lot of attention to because, and the way that I do this for myself is like I – before I upload it onto anywhere, I listen to it myself and have a listen through, which is so important because so many times I've picked up on, oh, oops, uh, I didn't mean to do that this way or whatnot. But if I have to constantly hit my volume button on my phone and it's above the midway point on my phone, then I know the sound's not right. And if someone sounds really loud and then someone sounds soft and I constantly have to adjust for that or if my music cuts in and it's really loud, then I know that that's what turns people off. And so I focused on trying to, you know, um, normalise the levels and I spent a lot of time on YouTube learning how to do that. Um, especially because the software I was using at the start isn't what I use now. So it's like I've had to relearn it twice, but I love it. So it's okay. Yeah. I hate hearing my own voice though. And I don't, I'd love to know if you're the same. <laughs> oh yeah, I don't, I have a really hard time listening through my podcast oh, back. My and that's what I'm starting to do now. Cause like, I never did that with the audio because I was, oh, just, yeah. I was just kind of like, oh, this is just for fun. And now I'm like, okay, your audio needs to be way better. And so that's why I'm asking. And that's why I'm like, okay, what yeah. should I edit with? Like, I've heard a lot of people use Audacity. So I'm like, okay, or um, is that, is Audacity the- um, It's free. Adobe? No, okay. No, it's, it's free. It's free. Okay. There's Adobe Podcasts and Adobe yeah. uh, that, Audition. Like, the There's Audition as well, which costs like an absolute bomb. I was nearly going to go that way. Like, oh, let's give this free one. Seriously. There's nothing technical that I do in Audacity that I need anything extra than Audacity for. And I spent, I I invested a couple of hours of my time learning about sound editing specifically because I knew that I have, I don't have a visual podcast. So the sound has got to be 100% or it's not 100%, but it's got to be good enough. I don't want people with an echo. I don't want to hear my voice in their sound. I don't want to hear it reverberating and stuff. And look, not everyone has a mic and this, where they are is is going to, you know, play with things a bit and you're going to have challenges that way. But, but the noise cancellation on it is fantastic. The equalisation and normalisation of the sound levels is fantastic. I've learnt about these terms like high-pass filters and low-pass filters and compressors and I know how to do some basic things that makes the sound sound well. No one's come to me and said it sounds atrocious, so... Maybe yeah. they're just being nice. Um, but it's free. So, you know, if you're looking for some new solution, hell, give it a go. Um, the other one that I've heard good things about is Reaper. Okay. I, I don't know. R-E-A-P-E-R. Now, I think you pay a very small amount once off and then that's all you need to do. And, like, if you were a commercial business, you have to pay more, but you don't otherwise. But um, if you put Audacity or Reaper into YouTube and do Audacity you know, sound skills, there'll be tutorials there. The other thing I did once you've settled on the sound one is I looked for ways to make my editing process faster, like yeah. hacks, keyboard shortcuts are key. <laughs> like, um, and that's what gives me the time to listen back to my podcast before I release it to the world, you know, um, you know, not taking forever to have to edit down to get an episode up in the first place gives me the time to be able to list to yeah no this is this is all great I this is um and there's some I've learned like yeah I think the other thing I've done and I'll be honest I'll be honest with you I think it actually helps me not have to listen to my voice the same way is I especially for where I'm talking I put my playback speed on one and a half times when I'm editing and that 
just makes it a lot quicker as well. Okay. Uh, I, um, I don't get rid of every single um because that's natural <laughs> to use it. I do silence when it's really audible that people are <gasps> like breathing, like heavy breathing, or some people have like, like you know, and you can yeah. see it on a wave file. But that's really like in in audacity, it's so quick to do that. Like mm-hmm. it's it hasn't been a chore to do that and stuff like that either. And you know, learning how to fade in and fade out. But um, I mean, you've been doing it longer than me, so I feel like it's silly me giving you tips. <laughs> that makes no, sense. I think it's it's great though because the these are the pieces that I don't necessarily always do, but I it just takes it that one step further and that is really what I am trying to do now now that I'm like okay I'm like serious about this and I like love doing it so yeah well just you know even if it meant that you delayed getting an episode out and said you know release a five minute episode and say hey hey guys I'm on a little mini break with episodes this week so unfortunately you don't get to hear someone's story but what's exciting is I'm going on this process and it's going to make me listening to my episodes even more exciting for you and easier to do and you know this week why don't you check out my back catalog and listen to the amazing story of in episode 12 where they they did blah you know and then your listeners know that you haven't gone away and you give yourself that buffer time to to learn your new skills so you know um but well, I should again, let you go make dinner <laughs> definitely definitely this has been a pleasure um yeah if you need to hit me up with any questions or anything let me know um yeah. but yeah it's all been really good yeah well have an amazing night Enjoy thank you very time. much you too you too have an amazing we'll day um, speaking from the future the day is good <laughs> <laughs> thank you good to know see oh. you later bye, bye.